Verse 23 of 1 Chronicles 16 says this, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Now look, that's not optional. You're not, it's not an option. You know, this whole thing of worship, it's not even an option for God's people. It's what you do. So if you're a follower of God today, you're going to sing and worship. No one said it had to be great. Just said sing to the Lord, all the earth. Now this is a part I really like. Because sometimes we miss this part in it all. Tell of his salvation from day to day. These aren't suggestions. They're like commands. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Verse 30. Tremble before him. You see, this is a holy moment. And all the earth, the world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord is king. Why? Because he is. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us, O God of our salvation. Save us and gather and rescue us from among the nations. I have no doubt God is trying to gather us and gather us in this place together that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen. And then they praised the Lord. That's what we're going to do together today. Praise the Lord. Will you stand and lift him up with everything in you? Hey, if your neighbor thinks you stink, who cares? Hey, come on up and sit by me. There's seats up here. I stink too, but we're going we're gonna to worship the Lord. Let's put our hands together. Anytime a heart turns from darkness to light, Anytime temptation comes and someone stands to fight Anytime somebody lives to serve and not be served I know, I know, I know, I know God is on the move, on the move sets men free. Anytime the choice is made to stand upon the word, I know, I know, I know, I know. Serves a searching soul, and someone says, Send me here, I go.
morning. Would you please have a seat for announcements? give you a special invitation to join us on Sunday mornings, 930 in the Young at Heart classroom for our small group connection. We, uh, we are studying vital signs of a healthy church. Anytime that someone checks your physical health, they check some vital signs, your temperature, your heart rate, your oxygen level, your, uh, pulse. And, uh, a church can be known for its health by looking at some vital signs. So join us Sunday mornings, 930, for Vital Signs of a Healthy Church. Hello, Farmdale family. Uh, just wanted to give you an update on our eGiving mobile app. Uh, the, the mobile app is changing. We're going to a new app. It's an upgrade. Uh, and this only applies to those that use the mobile app for donations. So if you use our online giving, then there's absolutely no changes and you continue to do that. Uh, as you know, <clears throat> the mobile app that we're using is called Give Plus. It's an older app. Uh, you can see it on my iPhone, uh, but it's transitioning to this new app called Vanco Mobile App. Uh, you can download it from the Apple or the Android store, and you can see it on my uh, phone, the new app. And uh, again, there's no changes in credentials. You just download the new app, then log in with your old credentials, and you just go. Again, this is uh, for those that use the mobile app on one-time donations, and we thank you for everything that you're doing for the kingdom. Uh, if you have any questions, just see me, Bill Meadows, Treasurer of the Church. Thanks again. Hey, Farmdale Leadership Team. Looking forward to our board meeting on Monday, November 8th. Monday, November 8th, 7 p.m. See you then. Morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. I just want to let you know that we'll be having our all-church breakfast Saturday, November the 20th at 8.30. Everyone come, because it's good. And after that, at 9.30, we'll be setting up the gym for our Thanksgiving dinner that'll be held on Sunday the 21st. We can uh, use all the help we can get.
All right, so this morning, a couple things I want to do. First of all, I want to say thank you to every single person that contributed and did other things. I want to say a special thanks to our staff who was here doing a lot of extra work. Will you just give them a hand? Our leadership team uh, and people who just took on extra roles, extra work. If people are sick, they took meals the whole nine yards. I mean, people were doing things. Uh, you came, you, you did the things you were asked to do in many ways. So just everybody give everybody that did something a hand because it was a very important time. Okay, where's the kids at? Where's our kids? Any kids still sitting there? Y'all come on up. I told you if you were here today, I was going to give you something. Come on up, grab you some out. Hal, get back. Get out of here, Hal. You can grab more than one. You can grab more than one. There you go. You can grab more than one. Grab out something you like there. Yes. You're not a kid. I'm, I'm, I'm a kid. All right, teenagers, you can get some too here if I, before it's over. Hal, Hal, there you go. We we'll gave some anyway. That's for all the extra work he did out there in this time. So I appreciate everybody and what they did. You can have some of this. Get it out of here before the service when it's over. You can come up and grab some stuff if you would. But I especially am grateful to everything and the time I was given uh, during this time. So I just want to thank you. Uh, God has taught me many things through the time. I'm grateful for that. And uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Arnie Wilson. I've been here for 13 years, Johnny Brooken. So uh, that's who I am. So. All right, well, thank you very much. Would you please stand as we continue to worship together this morning?
next song these altars are open if you'd like to come and pray to a time of prayer today. I'm going to ask Pastor Hal to come forward. And if you just need a, a touch of prayer today, you just need something special, you don't have to tell him what it's for unless you want to. But if you just want to come forward, he'll put his hands on and just pray for you as I'm praying today. You know, it's, a, it's interesting. In our front yard, I have a tree. And last year, this tree, it's some kind of pear tree. But last year, it didn't have anything on it. And this year, I noticed all this stuff on it. And I'm like, what is that? And it's some kind of little pear or whatever, but the tree, it looks to be a strong tree, but because all this stuff's on it, it's actually spreading the, the limbs out. Some of them have actually split off and fell, and it's just kind of weighed down. And I picked up one of the limbs, and I, was, and I, I mean, I'm, re I'm really strong. <laughs> I picked it up, and I was like, what in the world? It looked like this big, and it, on the end, all this stuff weighed it down. This is the beauty of prayer. That in our life, sometimes we are weighed down by life. There's things that come at us, and we just kind of feel the weight of it all. Prayer is that place where God invites us to come and let him deal with it. And so as you see this list right here, it's all kind of names on all kinds of things. We've had this week alone, we've had a family uh, of Gerald Loveland, 45 years old, COVID, other issues, pass away with four kids and a grandchild. That's heavy. Other people are just struggling with situations at work or situations within the family and things have kind of been weighing them down a little bit. And so as we pray this morning, I want you to know that God hears from heaven. He actually invites us to call out to him. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. I thank you, God, that you care about us in every detail of our lives, that you love us, that you want to engage us in relationship, and that you want to work in our lives. Lord, as I think about all the things that you do, uh, the way you guide us, the way you direct us, the way you shower love upon us, the, the way you bring your truth to us. Lord, you love us so deeply that maybe more than anything in this place today that we could somehow sense that love, embrace that love, and know that you are present with us in this place. There are people who've come in here today, God, that some of them, they're so excited. They're, they're shouting blessings, and they're grateful for everything they've recognized this week that you've done in their lives. And we, we have those stories, even on this board up here today. We have lives that were believed to be over and done with. We think of Charlotte's sister, who now, Lord, you have, you have brought her through some things. And even during her struggle, she accepted you as her Lord. We're so grateful for that, God. We're, we think about little Natalie today, and, and born at around a pound or so, at, at like 22 or 23 weeks. And Lord, really, it's still been touch and go through the whole process. But even yesterday, we see a picture of her and her mom 
and mom holding her in her hands, this little bitty precious life. And we recognize how you have been present with them. And we're so grateful for that. For these families that are hurting like Gerald and Mary Miller's family today over loss, God, I pray that you would be their comfort and their peace and embrace them. And Lord, teach us as a people how we can reach into this world around us that is broken and hurting people and allow us, Lord, in so many ways to share the good news of the gospel with them, I pray. And Lord, I thank you for the weeks you gave me of rest and time away. And I pray, God, that I will be better than ever for the kingdom. Use me however you choose, Lord, to reach into this world and reach those that you love so desperately. Lord, I believe in what you want to do in this place today. Lord, we don't take anything for granted. I'm grateful we have a chance to gather. I'm grateful you work through the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to guide us, and use moments like us gathering together to change our lives. I want to leave here different than the way I came today. And I trust your word will do that, and I trust your spirit will move in us today. Thank you for these dear people that I love so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.
We love our Farmdale pastoral staff and Arnie and Hal. We love you and appreciate for all that you do for us. Thanks Thank for being our pastor. pastor. We love, love you. Love you. <laughs> love your pastor. Love appreciate you. Your pastor. Appreciate you. Your sabbatical was good. We love you here. We're going to be happy to have you back. I love you, man. Love you, pastor. Appreciate it. Pastors, Pastor Arnie, Pastor Hal, I'd like to thank you so much for being here and for all you do. Love you. Love you. Thanks for everything. Thank you. Say something. Hello. <laughs> Say hi, Pastors. We love you. Go. <laughs> hey, Pastor Hal and Pastor Arnie, it's been a pleasure to be under your leadership. Leadership. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Ready? Go again. All right, take four. Go. Hey, Pastor Hal and Hal. <laughs> Six. Go. Hey, hey, start over. All right, go. Hey, Pastor Hal and Pastor Arnie, it's a visitor uh, or visitor member. Go. Hey, Pastor Arnie, Pastor Hal's doing such a great job. I'm sorry to say, but we really don't miss you that much, but we still love you a lot. We are uh, working toward the future of bringing back in our youth staff and uh, some, good, some good movements happening there, but it's great. Uh, Pastor Hal and Faith uh, do so much and been such a blessing, and I thank all of you who pour out your time and service to us. Now, if you think I'm going to be shorter today because of this, you're wrong. You know, normally I'm pretty short preaching, but uh, I've, been, I've been gone for a while, so i got a lot to say today. If you would, uh, it's good to see all of you. We have a saying around here, you're a guest only once and family after that, so welcome to the Farmdale family. You're welcome here anytime. Uh, if you would, turn today to Philemon and just, uh, just stay there in that book. It's a little letter, Philemon, toward the back of your Bible. I'm not going to read it right now, but I just want you to turn there so you can be there. It's good to be back with you, my church family. It's, it's really good to be back. I've, I've uh, been all over the place, it seems. Karen asked me, uh, Meadows asked me, did it feel a little strange getting back in the swing of things this past Monday? I told her, honestly, it felt like I was just on my normal schedule as if I'd never left four weeks ago. Time flew by for me. I traveled by car for over 3,000 miles. I flew by plane over 6,605 miles. And I had the chance to catch up with some old friends, see the artistic side of God and viewing his creation from the mountains of the northwest and watching rusting streams and waterfalls to the mesquite trees and rocky soil of Texas. I took the time to learn from others. I listened to several sermons. I, I viewed many services and I read some books. What I planned to be a restful time turned into a time of adventure. I went home for a couple of days, went out through the bottom land of Henderson County. Now, you may find that kind of crazy, but I find great joy in riding four-wheelers or these, now they call them these side-by-sides. And when I was younger and we had horses, I actually would come home from school, saddle up, and take a ride down there after school. Um, it's nothing but land and wildlife in these bottom lands, but for me, whatever reason, it relaxes me. I can feel the weight and burdens kind of fall off my shoulders. I had looked forward to that day for a while to get out on a side-by-side -side and go down through the bottoms, and we went out there. A, a nasty storm was brewing to our southwest and moving toward us. The wind was bending trees, and you could hear the thunder in the distance. Eric, my buddy who owned the, uh, the vehicle, said, you sure about this? It doesn't look good. 
And I said, ah, oh, it'll move through quick if it hits here. We took off a rolling with this sound bar. He had a sound bar in this thing, and it was jamming some good old tunes, and I was just going through the wind. It was a beautiful, to me, a beautiful day. It was cloudy, and rain was off in the distance, but it still was a beautiful time. The weather was great. And, and this thing had Bluetooth in it, so he was playing his song list through this. I'm like, man, this is true joy riding these days. I didn't have that years back. About 15 minutes into the ride, the storm reached us. It was raining so hard that even the speed of a crawl in that machine felt like glass was piercing our skin. And it was a cold rain as well. He was sitting over shaking his head as he was getting soaked. And I was screaming, this is adventure, man. This is adventure riding. A few more pelts of rain, though, and I said, hey, pull into the woods and get under a bunch of trees. Hopefully strong trees with strong limbs, too, because it was a fierce wind. And so we sat there for a while, and, and then it led up, and he said, you want to head back? I mean, we were drenched. He said, you want to head back now? I said, nah, man, let's keep going. It's clearing up. It's clearing up. He said, where? I said, somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Well, within 10 minutes or so, things got worse again. We found shelter again for the next 45 minutes until we found an opening to get back home. We drove. Two deer jumped out on our pathway, actually two big bucks, and they ran in front of us for a while. Some of you hunters hadn't seen a buck all year. I seen two big ones right there, and they just ran in front of us for a while. Then they jumped back into the woods, and I thought that was pretty wild. We popped up over a hill, and I saw a rainbow. And I was reminded that God was there with us. I preached and dedicated a sweet baby in Texas, and God was there with us. When I took this time, I was hoping for some grand revelation from God, you know? Maybe some direct plan that would change everything for the church. That would change everything for me and my family. You know, it's been tough. It's been tough in our society recently. Church attendance is dwindling away everywhere. I met with a guy this week whose church was running almost 700 people weekly. After the pandemic, they're down to 375. And so I'm thinking, God, give me something. Give me something to get people on fire again, to get them going what they should do. Help me do something that will reach them again. Do something, please. My desire was to seek God more than ever without so many things to do, too. I figured it'd be easy to get clarity on the plans for the future. See, I just knew this time would change everything. What I realized, though, in the midst of all of it, that God was with me. He was with me in those moments I got away for quiet, still times over the four weeks. And he was with me in the adventurous parts, too. It seemed like God was good to work with whatever posture I was in. And God taught me many things about myself during this time. But this is what he revealed to me the most. Because I'm not very complicated. I'm not that smart. So God deals with me in short things, little things. And it was a question. The question was, what really matters? It just kept coming to me. You see, a lot of things in our lives matter, but what really matters? Maybe you should write that down in your phone notes or on the bulletin. What really matters is, and you fill it in. I want to show you a video this morning I came across. Check this out. important to have the water drained out of your sink and this or your toilet and this is
She's pretty proud of the way she cleans the toilet. Now, I know you didn't expect to see a toilet cleaning demonstration in a sermon today. Now, listen. You can see the comments scrolling. I'm all for cleanliness. Most think it's next to godliness. But when I saw a lady take 12 minutes or so to clean a toilet, as the baby in the background sounded as if he or she needed attention, and I saw this lady use what seems to be over $100 worth of cleaning supplies. Now, I salute her commitment to measure, committed measures to eliminate bacteria and get the ring off the bowl. I can even thank her for sharing her way of doing it with the world. Some of the comments labeled, as you saw in there, they labeled her as a genius. Others said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Now listen, crazy thing. 10.4 million people viewed this. Now think of all the minutes consumed by that group of people. I'm sure some folks watched to really learn how to clean better. Others probably watched with some sense of expectancy, like if this woman continues to mix these chemicals, which we learn in like seventh grade not to do, we could see that toilet shoot up out of here beating China's hypersonic missiles in space and zap them ineffective. Some watched for entertainment, I guess. Some watched wondering if this was the next great thing, and some might have been delirious from a long quarantine and didn't know what they were doing. But when I think about this, I realize we are a people and a society preoccupied by things that don't matter. And for some of the things that do matter, we elevate them to what really matters category. The utmost importance to us and we're consumed by them. I thought about this video and I determined that a good old Clorox scrub for one minute would be sufficient to at least kill the bacteria if it didn't even get the ring around the bow. And the next 11 minutes could have been with the baby that was making noise in the background. Yeah, I think we live in a time where being preoccupied by things that don't matter is the norm now. I think it was one day last week I came home to find out we had been booed. The kids said, Dad, we've been booed. And I said, what? We've been booed. Well, in my old age and the way I grew up, to be booed was a negative thing. So you know what I said? Well, boo them back. And they said, we're going to. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute, we're Christians. Like, no. I said, hey, no, no, I got to talk to you. Let's not do that. I, I got to talk with you about what this is. And they said, then they explained to me what it was. Any of you been booed lately in life? Any of you? Few of you. The process of being booed is that you leave a bag or a pumpkin with treats in it, whatever you want, and you go up to a doorbell and you leave it on their, on their front porch and you ring and you take off. That's what you do. And then when it happens to you, you're supposed to take some stuff and do it to someone else, ring theirs, and then run off. Then you've been booed. Well, Faith told Reed and Grant that they would boo some neighbors up the street, but we got busy with things, and it was almost 9 p.m. one night. And I said, you know, I don't think that's a good idea on a school night. I just don't think that's a wise idea. Ringing a doorbell and running off in the dark is not so neighborly. She agreed, so she told the kids that we weren't going to do it that night. But Reed was not happy. He stopped off pouting. He could not imagine that life could go on by not booing this family that was snug in bed. It was an ordeal, y'all. An ordeal at our house. Now, the act of booing in this way is a pretty cool pay-it-forward type of act. I encourage the thought. I even see it as a fun thing to do as a family. But the questions I posed to Reed, who was having a meltdown, and the question I posed to us today is, does it really matter? Now, if they were hungry, thirsty, without clothing or without heat and air, well, then, of course, but to be booed or to boo someone else, does it really matter? I did a little research this week. Did you know, depending on what study you're looking at, that the average American 
spends anywhere from six to eight hours on the internet a day. Mostly social media or messaging apps. Numbers are higher between millennials and the Generation Z crowds. It equals out in some of these studies I read to over 50 hours a week depending on what study it was. And on the high end of this study, the time spent added up to the equivalent of 128 days. So for some, in a year's span, they are engaged in social media or a messaging app for basically 128 days. Now, isn't that mind-boggling to you? I read somewhere that for those that manage somehow to keep the limit down to two hours or less a day, it is proven that certain types of depression are decreased in their lives. Wow. Look, I find some happiness in these things, in these groups. They can be helpful. They're ways to connect through these apps on social media groups. I can say there's a lot of good that their services can't afford us. I like that it reminds us of birthdays, of our friends, and even people we don't remember that are on there as our friends. By the way, it's even caught some of you lying about your age. I like that. But that's a sermon for another time. But when we think about it, 128 days of a, of a year? I have to ask, does it really matter? Now, some of our teens are probably like, oh, yes, it does. But does it really? So what is it that really matters? I want to answer that at least in part today. Over my time away, I, I made my way into a Penn Station restaurant not far from my house. I like that place. And I noticed on a table was a Bible and a notebook. And when the young man finished my meal up, I asked him, I said, is that, is that yours? And he said, yes, it is. I said, he was young, early 20s probably. I said, man, that's great. That's a wonderful book, man. Wonderful book. He said, it's the only one that matters. And I said, you are correct. That ultimately is it, it's the only one that matters. And we talked for a little bit. I decided I'd try to go back in a week after that and see if he was working again because I wanted to give him an assignment. So I went back in, and sure enough, he was working again. And, and we talked for a little bit longer, and I said, hey, man, I got an assignment. I want you to read this from the Bible. And this young man accepted that. You see, what makes this book so special is that we believe that it is the inspired word of God for us, but that it also reveals what really matters. And so if we take the stories found within, they bring light to the struggles, the brokenness, the things that lead to death, the reality of sin and evil, and they tell us so much more about life, love, mercy, and grace. So much. Well, I read quite a story on the pages of, this, of the Bible recently. It's a letter, actually. It's the shortest of all of Paul's letters. It's just 335 words in the original Greek. This letter is unique in that it seems to be like a personal letter, and yet it's so powerful that the church recognized that Paul also meant this for public hearing. It's rich with themes of the Christian faith, especially how people found in Jesus are to treat and relate to each other. And when I read over it a few times, it reeks of what really matters. So let me paint a picture for you this morning of what's going on in this letter. There's this man named Philemon, and he is a Christian, a wealthy Christian living in Colossae. He has land and he has slaves. Now, slavery in the first century was different than the horror of the 15th through 18th century transatlantic slave trade, but it was still a form of slavery. Philemon, even as a newer Christian, would not have been under any notion that he should stop this way of life on his land because it was the common practice in his time. We have no idea how, but somewhere along life's journey, Philemon bumped into the Apostle Paul, and Paul told him all about Jesus, and he showered him with the good news of the gospel. And Philemon, the story says, believed. He wanted new faith. He wanted the new life, new commitments, the new ways. Now, that's enough good news right there to end the message and go home. But there's a lot more. Onesimus was a slave to Philemon. One day, Onesimus decided he's tired of life as usual. He's fed up with the working the land and being told what to do every day. So he entered Philemon's home and he stole stuff. My guess is he took money for his travels 
And if uh, Athea is Philemon's wife, as we assume in this writing, then he might have stolen some stuff from her jewelry box to pawn off somewhere. Keep in mind that slavery here is not as ugly as what we know of it. He was treated pretty well by this family. He was, scared, he was cared for, he was appreciated, and at times pretty much wanted by the family. Life as a slave wasn't great, but it wasn't the worst for him. Yet, he goes in and steals what he can, and he runs away to Rome, the story tells us. Rome is busy, it's a happening place. He figured he could pawn off some stuff, live among the many faces undetected as a thief, and a runaway slave. He figured if he got far and away, far enough away, you know, like, and he did, 1,400, almost 1,500 miles from Colossae, that it was like Philemon wouldn't find him if he did that. So Onesimus is now running the streets of Rome, but he wasn't free like he thought. He was a man still in bondage, but he had little understanding of why he felt that way. And one day, I don't know if he was, it was after he spent some money at a tavern and he had too much, maybe insulted the wrong guy and they got into it, or if he looked the wrong way at a Roman soldier, if he just got in with the wrong crowd in that big city far from the land he belonged in in Colossae, but somehow he ends up in jail or on house arrest close to the Apostle Paul who couldn't seem to stay out of jail or house arrest. But he was there for other reasons. Now, if, if you're a firm believer in coincidence, as you hear this story, just go ahead believing that if you want to. But I know better. While Onesimus is in with Paul, Paul does what is apparently the desire of God for all his followers. He shares the good news of the gospel and, and tells all God has done in Jesus and through God the Holy Spirit. And this man on the run accepts the gospel and wants to be a follower of Jesus. It's wonderful, isn't it? Man, Paul has now led both Philemon and now Onesimus, two people, and this time over 1,400 some miles, almost 1,500 miles away, he leads him to Jesus. And Paul's locked up during this. The crazy thing about Paul is that for him, what really mattered was telling everybody everywhere about Jesus. That's what mattered. Why? Because Paul knew what happened to him when Jesus got a hold of his life. And Paul couldn't imagine anything, no matter what it was, being more important than that. And Paul also knew that the beauty of this story, that this good news, that is what was for everybody, in every place. And I must admit, that's what I love so much about it. That, that this story is, is for a rich man in Colossae, and just as much for a runaway worker. This gospel is just as much for the well-educated, well-sheltered woman in the gated community as it is for the woman that's been abandoned and used and finds enough funds just barely by letting her body be viewed daily on some stage in town. It's as much for the man that's been really good and is a picture of a good father and a good husband and a good friend as it is for the man that has messed everything up and lost what he should have valued most. This gospel, man, it can get deep down in us and do things we never dreamed or imagined. And so Onesimus, he's experiencing that in Rome. He finally understood what freedom was when he listened to this story. And Paul and Onesimus, they got really close during this time, the story says. Some say it was like a father and son type of deal. And one day Onesimus, he's in this new Christian faith and he's learning and God is really working with him. The Holy Spirit's all over him and he can't hold back his past, the things he has done, because the Holy Spirit won't let him. And it's going on and on. And so he decides, man, I can't do this anymore. I can't be deceitful. I can't lie. He has to be truthful about his story. So he tells Paul, Paul, actually I came here to Rome from a small province called Colossae. And Paul lights up and reveals he knows about Colossae. Paul says, hey, I've told people this same story from there and they believed it as well. Really, Onesimus says. Well, there's a man there named Philemon and, uh, and uh, well, uh, and Paul jumps in, Philemon, my gracious, he's my friend. He's my brother in Christ Jesus. Well, what do you know, Jesus? What about this, Jesus? You've done it again, God. You've done it again. 
And he says to Onesimus, hey, Onesimus, when you go see him, when you get back, if you get back, I want you to tell him this for me. And Onesimus is thinking to himself, uh, wow, God really has done something wild here. Paul, Onesimus says, I don't think I'll go back. And if I did go back, I don't think it'd be something Philemon would want. Well, he might want it, but only for what he could do to me. You see, I stole from his house. I left there as fast as I could get to Rome, and I blew pretty much all of it now. Now, Onesimus, as well as Paul, knew that if a person stole something and fled and was caught, they could be crucified under Roman law. This was a serious situation for Onesimus. His faith didn't excuse his past to the Roman government or others he had wronged. He needed something miraculous to happen to change his situation and to change his future. And he wasn't even sure if he would pray to God about it because, I mean, my goodness, his mentor Paul was close to Jesus and he's under house arrest for like the millionth time. And he didn't even know if he would get out this time. So he's not even sure what to do. By the way, did I tell you Paul was under arrest because he couldn't stop doing what he thought was really important? He kept telling everybody everywhere about Jesus. Now, Onesimus, he didn't want to go back, but Paul told him, hey, you got to go back. Because Paul knew what the Holy Spirit was doing to Onesimus. You see, when things aren't right, God speaks. And for Paul, being right with God and making things, in, thinking, making things right wherever needed was more important than in li if life was taken on a cross. You know why? Because God would give it back anyway. That wasn't going to be the end of his story anyway. The cost didn't outweigh the reward. So Paul told Onesimus, he, he said, oh, you're going to go back, but I got, I'm going to write you a letter, and you're going to take it to him, and then once you get back, I think everything will be fine, Onesimus. He basically tells him, it's, I think it'll be okay. And Onesimus is sitting here scratching his head thinking, says the guy under house arrest again. How do you know it's going to be okay? Well, he trusts in Paul, and he heads back to Philemon's house with that letter. And when he arrives, Philemon sees him coming and he thinks he's either seeing a ghost or a total lunatic. Why come back and face this wrath, he thought. And as he starts to yell for some chains to bind him for arrest and then likely death, Onesimus says, hey, I have a letter from Paul. You know Paul, right? You do know Paul. The Paul that told you about Jesus, you know the love of Jesus, that Paul. And Philemon says, you know Paul too? Yes, he told me the good news about Jesus and I received it. And Philemon opens up this short letter. And Paul does what he normally does in a letter. And then we hear this from Paul. And I want you to look at verses 4. And we're just going to read the letter through 22. He says, when I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God. Because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty. Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man. <laughs> he, that's rough language, isn't it? He's appealing to him as an old man. And now, also in here, he does it again, as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I've become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, that is, my own heart back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated you from for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, to me but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or does anything, charge that to my account. 
I, Paul, am writing this by my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your own... I love this line. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I'm writing you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. One thing more, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. This letter tells us that Philemon had been about the work of God. If you read it, he, he had been loving others. He had been sharing the good news. It was expected of all believers. And he did that, and he did it well, according to Paul. So Paul says, as a leader, that I could order you to treat Onesimus in a certain way because he meant so much to me, like a son to me. But he said, I'd rather appeal to love. Meaning, I'd rather appeal to your heart that had been changed by God. And then he gets to these verses, 17 and 18. I want you to look at those one more time. Verses 17 and 18. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you have welcomed me. You would welcome me. Verse 18. If he has wronged you in any way, well, he had wronged him. And he owes you anything. He owed him a lot. Charge that to my account, Paul says. See, Paul knew Onesimus could actually never pay what he owed. But Paul could. Now where in the world have we heard such a thing before? Where had Paul heard this? Oh yeah, the good news of the gospel. Paul met Jesus, the Jesus he persecuted, the Jesus he ran from, not to. And Paul was lost. He owed a debt he could not repay. But Jesus said to him, Paul, my Father and I and the Holy Spirit, we have figured it out. I have paid your debt. It's charged to my account, Paul. You see, it appears that what really matters to God then is us. It's us. What really matters is that we would be what we were created to be. And so when we hear this news like, God so loved, loved, loved us so much, He, it can be more than words on a page it can be truth branded on our hearts. Jesus came from the splendor of heaven to earth for us because that's what really matters. And if that's what really matters to God, then that must be what really matters to his followers who have experienced his great life-giving love. I like what one commentator said. The real problem of the letter is not Onesimus' slavery, but Philemon's freedom. Think about that for a minute. That's true. Because it's in freedom that we choose. We choose what we do with that freedom. We choose how we do it. But in all the choices that we're given in that freedom, do we act on what really matters with it? Do we choose Jesus and his ways? The letter doesn't actually tell us what Philemon decides to do. Don't you hate that? I'm sitting there like, man, this is like a movie without a real resolution to it. I don't like those kind of movies. Now, I wonder if it was on purpose or if Philemon never writes back because Paul's coming for a visit someday, he says. But if you dig a little bit more, which I had to, I couldn't leave it alone. I dug a little bit more, and it seems that Philemon actually does forgive Onesimus and works on their relationship as brothers in Christ. He accepts him as he would have accepted Paul, it appears, like family. And that changes things. Some scholars believe, actually, if you study, that Philemon also sets Onesimus free to go back and help Paul spread the good news. And some think that this same Onesimus eventually becomes the bishop of Ephesus in the second century. It seems Onesimus and Philemon caught on to what Paul already knew. That what really matters is that Jesus has paid it all. And that this good news found in Jesus must be shared at all costs. Above all else. Because it's for all people. And it has the power to change everything. 
Yet today, I think many followers have become preoccupied by things that don't really matter. I think it's actually a ploy of Satan to lull us to sleep in comfortable, comatose kind of way, oblivious to what it is that matters for every person. Now, I'm not suggesting we aren't to enjoy things in life. God wants us to. Or that we aren't to have entertainment or occasionally scroll on the phone or have a hobby. But I think the question, what really matters to God, must be asked each day by those who say they are his followers. Does the world need to know that you shot par on a round of golf or shot 20 over, as some of you do? Or that there was a rough outing or you caught a big bass? Deer head on the wall, another one. Or you scrapbooked quite well that day. Or you shopped for hours and you got some new things. Or you beat the game or you candy crushed to crazy levels. Or you won every Fortnite match. Or another day at the lake house. Or another book series that you read is now complete. I mean, is that what really matters? Really? Is that what matters? Now, I know it might matter to you, and we all have those things, but what will really leave, what will it be that will really leave a mark on our family, our church family, our friends, our co workers, and our neighborhoods? What has eternal value that impacts the here and now? It's only God and the good news that He gives us, because it's the only thing that will last forever. None of the other stuff will. So they may matter a little bit, but they don't really matter. I want to show you a little video I came across. I I know I'm longer today, but hey, that's not too bad for a man that's been gone for four weeks. They usually text. They usually text. Okay. Well, we're sorry you're in the hospital, but happy. So I'm getting my hair braided. Setting your hair braided feels nice. It does. <laughs> it's out of your face now. Oh my god. <laughs> Thank you. You are welcome. Yes. Just a little video I came across. I have no idea if she's a Christian. I have a stinking suspension and a hunch she is. And it's, and she is it's been impacted by the love of God in such a way. It seems to me as she spreads it to others. On her day off from the hospital, she goes back and does these kinds of things to the patients. My guess is it's a door in also to share the good news. Let me ask you, when was the last time you shared this story? The last time. I bet you everyone sitting in this room has family members that don't know Jesus. I bet you some of you have friends and co-workers who've never even heard this story. You see, 20, 30 years ago, most people had heard the story, at least part of it. Nowadays, they don't even know the basic stories of the Bible. That's proven. So my question is, how, when's the last time you've shared it? What really matters to you? Write it down. What matters? What really matters to me is, you write it down. Don't lie to yourself. Write it down. And maybe, just maybe, we'll trust in God and the good news to let it do us some good and then let it do good to the world around us. So you ask me, Pastor, what really matters? I can tell you now, it's not how hard you hit the baseball, how great you shoot the shot. It's not if you make a little more money. It's not that you caught the biggest fish. It's not that you, hey, somebody came along, you had a good party last night for Halloween. That stuff's great, fine, hang out. What a, it's not what really matters, though. Because it just doesn't have long-lasting value. And we treat all those things as if they do. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath.